which would be inconvenient. Worse, you might damage the train. If the pantograph loses contact, it causes an arc. In the safety of a high-voltage lab, an arc looks very pretty. Whoa! So what are we seeing here? So this is something called a Jacob's Ladder, and we're making a high-voltage arc, which is travelling up. Arcing happens when there's a break in a high-voltage circuit. In the Jacob's Ladder, there's a gap in the circuit between the two poles. The voltage is so high that it turns the gap into plasma, superheated air. And plasma is very hot, close to 10,000 degrees C, making arcs very dangerous indeed. That's arcing that we're looking at. Exactly. So that's what would happen if the pantograph moved away from the actual wire. Arcing does happen on normal trains. Here, icy overhead wires are breaking the circuit. But the higher the voltage, the more arcing is a problem. In this demonstration, I'm going to play the pantograph to see what happens to my paper train when the connection is broken. So this is a demonstration of the potential bad side of high voltage. Yeah, so the copper bar is at high voltage, and if yeah. you touch that pole to it and move it away, you'll make a high voltage arc. OK. There we go. But when it gets near to things... Aha! Yeah, straight away, that's... Do you know, I can see the downside there. What's happened is it set fire to my train quite badly. OK, so it's no surprise that the plasma arc ignites a paper train, but it can also damage a real train and its overhead wires. To prevent damage that could take whole lines out of action, the engineers needed a pantograph that would not lose contact with the overhead wire. And the key to their solution lies in this. This is just a crowbar. Well, a lever. And used in the right way, it can keep the pantograph pressing against the wire no matter what. Which is a good thing, because you really don't want to mess about with dodgy connections and massively powerful electrical supplies. Levers are essentially pretty simple devices. There's something long, like this, that pivots around a fulcrum, like that. The longer the lever, the more it can lift. So, to move something heavy, like this anvil, I'm going to need a longer lever. Yeah, that, that should do the job in place, and, well, that's, that's easy. It was the Greek scientist Archimedes who first worked out the significance of the distance between fulcrum and where the force acts on a lever. He reckoned, rather famously, that with a long enough lever he could move the earth. They would, of course, have needed somewhere to stand to do it. The bullet train's unique pantograph acts like a lever, too. A spring pulls the pantograph up. If the spring contracts, it pulls with less force. To compensate, a cunning mechanism automatically lengthens a lever, increasing the force. The whole thing is a compensatory mechanism, and the result is a constant pressure against that wire. And so far, they've been able to keep the train supplied with high-voltage power without frying the pantographs. With power on board, the engineers face their next challenge. How to convert the power to speed. And in particular, how to make a train fast from a standing start. It needs the right balance of power and grip. Making something fast isn't just about making it more powerful. You need to consider its weight too. Light is good. That's why they don't make fast cars out of lead. You may have noticed. But here's the thing. You can make something too light. If a vehicle's too light, it can't grip the ground enough to get traction, which is how things like cars and trains turn engine power into movement. Without traction, you're not going anywhere, no matter how big your engine. To demonstrate, I've created my own train and a very slippery track for it to run on. Yeah, well, 
as I think you can see. No matter how much power I use, no matter how much oomph I give it, and I'm giving it plenty, my wheels on my train just can't get enough grip to get me moving. In fact, sometimes the more power I use, the worse it gets. My train doesn't have good traction because it's too light to grip properly. Of course, wheel trains don't run on skid pans, but they too can suffer from not having enough traction. One way to improve traction is to increase weight, especially if the added weight is over the driven wheels, which in the case of this pickup is the rear wheels here at the back, all of which means that lot needs to go in there. So carry on, I'll be here. Isn't it great when everyone pulls together? Team effort. There we go. The last bag in place. I did all of that there. Those bags then, the weight right over the driven wheels at the back of the truck. Time to test it. I, well, OK, we have added about half a tonne above the rear axle. No contest. Same skid pan, more weight, better grip, better traction. But the last thing you want to do to a train designed for speed is add weight. Instead, bullet train engineers found the solution to their traction problems in an early luxury racing car, the Lona Porsche. In 1899, Ferdinand Porsche, yeah, that Porsche, designed a pioneering car in which each wheel was driven by a separate motor, the first four-wheel drive. And as off-roaders the world over know, with more driven wheels, you get better traction. I'm going to need to modify this vehicle. Whew. Right, that's done. This truck is now four-wheel drive. More wheels driving, it should grip. And it does. Making all four wheels driven means better traction without added weight. And the Japanese did exactly the same with the bullet train, flipping the traditional train around completely. Conventional trains use locomotives, big, heavy powerhouses that pull or push the other carriages along. But the bullet train engineers have kind of turned that principle on its head because the pointy carriages at the front and the very back of this train have no engines. Instead, all the other carriages do. It's called a multiple unit system. And on this train, 14 of the 16 carriages have their own motors. And here, each motor drives two wheels, so it is, by my reckoning, 112-wheel drive. Good traction without the extra weight means it can accelerate suitably quickly for a bullet train. All thanks to a 19th century 4x4. The next challenge for the engineers was how to keep that speed up round corners. Cornering too fast is a problem for any vehicle. This is Dave. He and his motorcycle sidecar are going to be the guinea pigs in my new challenge. This, by the way, isn't just an awkward to get at refreshment system. This water is part of the experiment. It's science. Take it away. Can Dave and the drinks complete my slalom course? Now we come to the first turn. Here we go. Dave and I go one way, and the drinks go the other. I'm going to be thirsty. I mean, Dave, saw my drinks gone. No big surprises there. Okay, but in the interest of science, we must dot the i's and cross the t's. 
We all know the feeling, if you've ever been around any sort of corner at speed, when you feel you're being pushed to the side. It's called centrifugal force, and basically it's because you, your body as an object, wants to carry on going in a straight line, but the car, or bike, is pulling you that way. So relative to it, you feel a force throwing you that way. And centrifugal force can have deadly consequences. In Osaka in 2005, a commuter train took a bend too fast and flew off the tracks. 107 people died. Thankfully, derailment is rare. But tight bends and high speeds produce strong centrifugal forces. Bullet train engineers didn't want to slow the trains down. To get round the problem, they turned to some of the very first wheeled vehicles. Chariots. Ancient charioteers knew how to corner quickly without flying off track, and so did their modern counterparts. This is a modern chariot, a scurry. Jeff Osborne is our Ben-Hur, and these are his ponies. Zig and Zag. So what, what am I going well, to do? What you're going to do, you're going to keep the car stable. I thought I was just saying they'd been a passenger. I'm going to bring oh, a book. No, I mean, no, 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 no. You're not going to read a book. You're going to lean this way and lean that way. So if I get it wrong, we'll roll over. These modern charioteers race around twisty courses with lots of cornering. And to keep the scurry stable, usually Alison sits on the back and leans into the turns. But today, I'm doing it. No pressure, then. Never let go. If a pony trips, you'll be straight out the back. Bad. So, one, two, okay. lean. One, two, lean. And I lean the way as far and as into you can. the turn as far as I can yeah. go. If the wheel starts coming off the ground, you lean further. Right. So, after that, frankly, terrifying briefing, we're off. Oh, this is nice. I like this speed. This is fast enough. into bends reduces the centrifugal force that pushes us outwards. This balances the carriage and allows Zig and Zag, like their ancient counterparts, to corner faster. It's a technique first recorded by ancient Greek author Homer in his epic account of the Trojan War, the Iliad. Ancient charioteers couldn't possibly have known about the Newtonian laws of inertia and centrifugal force. How could they? They haven't been invented yet. But somehow they instinctively knew that leaning helps you turn faster. I'm sure it looks lovely, but it's really frightening. <laughs> but what about my prototype mobile bar? To see if leaning is the key to success, I fired Dave and drafted in Frank. So, I am going to try this again. I am determined to crack my motorcycle mobile refreshment system solution. And I'm going to use this, which is a rather different motorcycle and sidecar outfit, because this one tilts. I'm ready, sir. This sidecar tilts instantly and effortlessly as it corners, keeping my drinks firmly in place. <laughs> that is astonishing! Ben Hur was clearly onto something, though I'm pretty sure he never foresaw its impact on mobile refreshment systems. Science works! Who'd have thought? So, the more they lean, the less the force pushing outwards on sidecars, chariots, and trains. To make trains lean, tracks are banked, inclined into the bend. 